And Satan will try to abolish your soul. There's only one hope. You have your Bibles this evening. If you will, turn to Revelation chapter number 17. Revelation chapter number 17. I would, however, draw your attention to a verse, a passage in Revelation chapter number 16, where as we will kick off our study tonight, that I think is key in helping us progress through the book of Revelation. I didn't turn that on, did I? Okay, so we're in Revelation chapter number 17. It's been a few weeks. We, we stepped away from the book of Revelation and we actually studied a little bit of eschatology in, from the book of Daniel. We compared some of what Daniel uh, taught with what John you know, prophesied and we saw how the prophets most certainly uh, were speaking of the same time period and how their prophecies overlapped and, and we spent some time comparing those. When we were last in the book of Revelation, we found that in Revelation chapter number 16, the pouring of the vials. You will remember the judgments of God that come upon the earth in the order in which we have been studying them as they are placed in the book of Revelation. The rapture of the church is the next great event that we look for in what I call prophetic history. The rapture of the church, we have studied many times, takes place in chapter number 4. Uh, the beginning of chapter number 4, uh, which is the time of the end of the church ages, which are depicted in chapters 2 and chapters 3. After the church is taken away, we remember we studied the, the seals that were broken, the scrolls that were unrolled. We talked about seals and how they sealed documents and how they kept documents together and even how they were used in the formation of books. And so when we were studying the seals, we saw how that the seals were open one by one, revealing a new chapter in the history that is yet to come. It was under those seal judgments that, uh, that we saw the ride of the four horsemen we saw the different effect of God's judgment upon the face of the earth, upon mankind itself. We saw how that each one of those riders, the different horses, what they represented, how that there would rise up one who would become a conqueror even without a war. We saw how that there will be a time when People are searching for, seeking an answer to the world's problems and there will appear the one that they are looking for. We saw these sealed judgments and the effect that they had upon the earth. At the opening of the sixth seal, we were revealed unto us the trumpets, the seven trumpet judgments, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 11 really gave us the detail of those trumpets being blown and the results of those trumpets being blown. Chapter 10 sort of gave us an overview. It was one of those interlude chapters. When we came to chapter number 16 is when the bowls, the final judgment, was poured out upon the face of the earth, upon mankind, if you will. And so I said we were going to look at a passage in Revelation chapter number 16 and verse number 19, we find the result of these, of these vile judgments, if you will. The Bible says, And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. 
We've examined uh, terminology used here, the cup of wine of God's wrath, the fierceness of His wrath. Chapters 17 and 18 give us a picture of the judgment of God on a system, an empire, a literal city, if you will, a headquarters, the great city, a city called Babylon the Great. Among other things, Babylon in Scripture, as we have learned, is representative of, and the literal city Babylon <clears throat> was marked by spiritual idolatry, religious idolatry, and religious apostasy. We are here tonight because we are characterized as religious people. Would you agree with that statement? We are here tonight because we are considered or we consider ourselves religious people. Would you agree with that statement tonight? You're here for a reason. You're here because you want to worship the Lord. You want to worship God. You want to learn from His Word. People are incurably religious. By that I mean every person in the world is, has a desire for, wants to be, is seeking to be religious. We are Christians. We practice Christianity. To some Chris, that is considered to be a religion. If you want to characterize Christianity as a religion, then you say it is the only religion that can bring one to God because it brings us to God through Jesus Christ. Amen. But people are really as I put it, incurably religious, we can't help it because God created us to be worshipers. God created us, Brother Gerald, with a desire to worship something greater than what we are. God created us with a desire to seek some force greater than what we are. There are so many different religions in the world that are false religions that appeal to men and women and false religion grows at an astounding alarming rate throughout the world combined even faster than Christianity itself. There is, it's almost as if God created within man a kind of a God-shaped vacuum that we are constantly seeking to fill, someone called it one time. A God-shaped vacuum that we are, it's an emptiness, it's a, it's a need that we're constantly trying to fill or fulfill in our lives. God created us. To have that type of desire so that he could introduce himself to us. As I shared with these two ladies this morning as they were following the conviction of Holy Spirit, realizing that there was something that they needed in their lives. There was a void. There was something that they desired that they had not found anywhere else. It was that vacuum, that need that needed to be fulfilled. Because we were born to seek out something greater than we were. And again, that's how God introduces Himself to us. But as I was sharing with them, and not these words, but something similar to this, sharing with them the story of the Garden of Eden and the tragedy that took place there, 
Since the fall of man, our longing that God gave us to know God has been twisted. It's been perverted. And the devil uses that to his advantage to introduce himself as if he were God. The devil uses, he knows what we desire and so he tries to, to counterfeit what we think we need with something that he would have us to experience. Am I making sense to you tonight? He takes that desire God has given you and he misdirects that desire. People are seeking to worship but they no longer seek the true God. Romans 3 and 11, Paul writes, there is none who seeks for God. He was quoting Psalm 14. Jesus declared that no one comes to the Father who sent me unless the Father draws them through Holy Spirit. We have a need. God draws us to Him so that He can fulfill that need by introducing us to His love, His grace, and His mercy. But at the same time, Satan has, since he has had the opportunity, always offered something counterfeit to make people feel good about themselves. Somebody asked me what I thought about Joel Osteen about 15 minutes ago. I think you need to listen to somebody else. And I think you need to turn him off. And this is what I said to that person, not to make them mad at me. But you ask me a question, I will give you an answer. Joel Osteen does not preach. Very rarely does he ever introduce you to God as being a judgmental God that judges sin. Rarely, if ever, have I ever heard him explain that the greatest need a man has is a relationship with Jesus Christ. That a man must be born again and that God must change a man. His message is more like you have the power within yourself to change yourself and become a better person. And that's what we are created to be is better people. You ain't going to be nothing better than what you are right now until you turn to Jesus Christ and you put your faith and trust in Him and you let Him work in your life. Amen. That's right. There are so many who will proclaim that you can feel that need that you have to be a better person by simply changing your lifestyle. First of all, if you don't change your life's direction, you're never going to have that need met. And it must start through Jesus. And abounding hope, I'm going to preach Jesus till I can't breathe anymore. Amen. You put me out on the street, I'm going to preach Jesus. One day, I think Stephen's going to pass through church, so I figure when that happens, I'll always have a place to go preach, at least every now and then. Say amen. <laughs> <laughs> we have this need. And people have ideas of how we can find this satisfaction apart from Christ. False religion, it's not surprising at all that false religion is going to play a major role in the end times because Satan will manipulate people and he will produce something within them, that desire, and he will introduce himself as the one who can meet that desire in his Antichrist, and, and, and he will give the world what they are longing for. We are a religious people. There are many different religions so different from each other and yet so much alike. There are many, many religions that are so different from each other and yet they are so much alike. <coughs> Nearly every major false religion has, as we've learned in the past, a set of rules, a set of guidelines. When you compare those to the Ten Commandments, if you take away those commandments that speak of a relationship with God, if you take those away, thou shalt have no other gods before me. 
Thou shalt not use, thou shalt not make any graven images, no idols. You shall not use the name of the Lord your God in vain. If you take away those commandments that address our relationship with God, and you move to those parts of the commandments that address our relationship with one another, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet. Those commandments that deal with our relationships with one another, so many false religions have something that is very similar to those statements. And so there will come a time when all of these false religions will be united under one religious umbrella, if you will. They will all be blended together. They will all be accepted as one. And that religion will be the religion that Antichrist uses to unite the world. And so that religious system is a part of this great harlot, Babylon. The political system, politics will be united together under the system of Antichrist. And these politicians will be, these kings will support this religion that unites the world. And so you have all of these powers united together supporting a religious system that they can all agree on. And when there is unity, then there will be economic unity as well because we're all supporting one another and we all have the same agenda. And we will, and men and women of that day will have that God shaped vacuum filled with counterfeit religion. A religion that's supported by politics, a religion supported by politics that brings about prosperity until God's judgment is poured out and begins to disrupt the world's economy. I tried to make that just as simple as I could possibly make that because there are three elements really that are involved when you talk about Babylon. Religion, politics, and economics. And this will be the way that Antichrist, false prophet, Satan unites the world together. Religion unites the way, unites the world in a way that economics does not unite the world. We can't agree economically with nations around the world. Some years ago, some great political mind decided that we needed some kind of a world trade agreement that would strengthen poor countries and would, would, would help their economy to the point that it would somehow help our economy. I'm just going to go ahead and be political. Ross Perot said, if they sign NAFTA, there will be a great sucking sound and that will be the sound of all of our jobs leaving America and our economy is going to dwindle down to nothing and I believe he was right. How many of you would like to have a better job than what you have? How many of you would like to have a job, period? I'm telling you a one world philosophy is really not the best thing for the world Christ for the world is absolutely the best thing for the world. Economically, we will never agree with the rest of the world on the best way to use the resources God has given us. I believe the best way to help someone who is in need is to make sure that those who would be willing to help can provide a way to give that help. Amen? Don't leave mad. I'm just saying, economically, there's never been a plan that really benefits the world 
as if there was a one world economy. There should be more exports than there are imports if your nation wants to be strong enough so that when called upon to give to poor nations, you've got something to give. Amen. Economically, we can't agree. Politically, we will not agree until this time. How many of you like the liberty that we have in America? We have freedom. God bless the USA. I believe that a republic is the absolute best situation for every nation. The United States is a republic. Okay? The United States is a republic. We have freedoms. We have liberties. We have economic opportunities. We have religious opportunities. I believe that this is the greatest government system in the world today. But if you talk to folks in China, they believe communism is absolutely the best political system in the world. And they believe that it is absolutely best for government to control most of your decisions. It's better for the government to make decisions for you than you to then allow you to make decisions for yourself. The world will never politically agree. The world, however, does come into religious unity, as I have already described, in that those tenets, those commandments, those ethical statements that speak on how we're supposed to deal with one another come into play. Religions around the world, religious people agree on how we should treat one another. Governments don't always agree on how we should treat one another. So religion is going to be the unifying factor in the end times that draws the world together. She will be called Babylon, the great heart, the religious system that unites us, not us. We're gone. Unites the world. Everybody coming together, feeling good about themselves, believing that there is something inside of us that can cause us to be better people, that there is some force, whatever force that may be, that can help us in our quest to find fulfillment in ourselves. And God is going to judge that system. And that's what the whole tribulation and great tribulation is about. It's about judging sinners as God reveals Himself to the world. He is judging these systems. He is judging these religions. He is judging Satan himself. And he is letting his wrath come upon a world that rejects him. False religion. The thing that unifies the people will be the very thing that causes their destruction. Can you say amen? So we could say, and whenever I give you your handout, which I'm not doing yet, obviously, false religion's powerful appeal comes from its promise to satisfy man's longing for the spiritual realm without bringing him under God's authority. We must submit ourselves unto God and we must submit ourselves unto His authority as it is revealed in His Word and as His Spirit reveals it unto us if we are to have a relationship that God requires of us. False religion by steps God 
and tells us that we can achieve all that we need just by the way that we treat one another. If you treat one another good when you die, you won't come back as a cockroach. You might come back as a bird that eats the cockroach. I don't know. If you're really good, you might come back as the dog that... Or maybe if you really reach enlightenment, you can come back as a man. But some say to go even further than that, if you reach total enlightenment, then you don't have to come back at all. Nirvana. We studied a lot of this. We have a desire to see something greater than we are. And Satan is always using that to his advantage. And so the ultimate expression of false religion will be an essential element of Antichrist's final world campaign in holding together his military, his economic, and his political structure. And so chapter 17 reveals the spiritual nature of Antichrist's kingdom. And then chapter 18 continues to reveal unto us the material aspects. God will destroy both of those as they pertain to the Antichrist kingdom. Spiritually, He will destroy that religion. Economically, physically, He will destroy the kingdoms. And that's what chapter 17 and chapter 18 will show us. Chapter 17 and chapter 18 are in essence revealing unto us what actually took place in chapter number 16 as those vials were being poured out. So it is a look back at what's at, at the result of each of these vials being poured out. And so when we read chapter number 16 and we read verse number 19, and the great city, city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God, to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath, he judges false religion, he judges and tears down the economic system, and he tears down the political system, and those three make up what we see as Babylon. Amen? And so, when you get to chapter number 17, really it's showing us the destiny of the satanic kingdom as it were. Let's read just a little bit. In chapter number 17, it's the beginning, chapter 17, 18, of really the seven dooms that are presented in the book of Revelation. There's a theme. Seven candles, seven spirits, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls, and now seven dooms. Chapter number 17, verse number 1. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come up hither, and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. We don't know if it was the first, the second, the third, fourth, fifth, or sixth angel. But one of those angels, unidentified as such, says to John, let me further show you what has been going on. I will show you the judgment that's taken place. The great harlot, the great whore, Babylon as it's being referred to, that sitteth upon many waters. Many waters represents many peoples, many nations, multitudes of people. John is being told by the angel, come and let me show you how we have judged the one who has misled so many people, so many waters. Verse 2, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have made, not, have made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Well, we understand that those kings 
represent those nations, the leaders of those nations who have come together to support this system. While we're not going to get there tonight, and I'm just briefly going to get through some of this, ultimately what you're going to see happen is those rulers who have supported this religion and have used this religion to their advantage are going to turn against this very religion. The very thing that they use to get their power to unite their people, they are going to abandon. You ever had someone to, looking back, maybe you feel like they used you to advance yourself or to get ahead, and then they forgot all about you after they had arrived. Has that ever happened to anybody? Really? Y'all have lived sheltered lives if that's never happened to you. Because sometimes the tendency of man is to make all the allies that he can to get to where he wants to go. But when he gets to the top, he seems to forget about those who helped him get there. Reddit, does that sound familiar to you at all? Really, indeed, these leaders are going to ride the waves if you will. And they are going to enjoy all the people gathering together and then they're going to try to dominate them and turn against that system themselves because they will want personal glory. And so with whom the kings, we've read that, uh, the wine of her fornication, that means that they have fallen under her influence. They've all fallen, they begin to think the same way, to see things the same way. They are influenced if you drink fermented grape juice. If you drink enough of fermented grape juice, you're going to start seeing things a little bit differently. So I've been told. And so when it talked, well, I got one person that's bold enough to, you know, that foreigner sang that song back in the 80s. Woo, double vision. I think they must have sang that song after they'd had too much wine and wasn't seeing straight or something. Huh? I don't know. Influence. Wine is very intoxicating. It, is, it influences your thought process. Just as this religion will intoxicate people and will influence their decision making. And so John says in verse number 3, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten kings. Next week we'll examine those seven heads and those ten kings, but it's basically those who are supportive of her. She is wearing purple and scarlet, which means that she is considered as one to be heralded. We have purple in here. Got a lot of compliments from folks outside the church yesterday at the wedding. Some folks I would never ever have expected to walk into Abounding Hope Church and said how beautiful it is. Purple is such a beautiful color. And I agree. It speaks of royalty. There's just something about purple. It's that majestic kind of a feel. That's why kings wore that color. They actually wore the color purple, which was more like a scarlet red between the two of these because it was the most expensive to make. That's why they wore it. Because of the berries and the dyes and so forth that it was used to make it, it set them apart because it's expensive. That's why we're wearing it. We somebody. But I like purple. People that wore purple were heralded as someone above others. And that's to represent the names of blasphemy obviously refer to her blasphemous nature against God against the character of God against everything that is of God anti-God verse 4 says the woman is arrayed in purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones pearls having a golden cup in her hand full of abomination and filthiness of her fornication I got some really good pictures I'll show you next week in that cup are the things that bring the world pleasure things that they enjoy things that make them feel good about themselves 
And she promotes that feel good about yourself philosophy. Even though things are falling apart in the world, there is something about you that you can overcome. And she influences them to trust in the Antichrist. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. And her name was Babylon. Three systems under one rule, under one influence, that being Babylon. Uniting the world together, causing the world to depend upon themselves rather than to depend upon God. To look to fill that God-shaped vacuum in another way besides trusting God. Through all of these terrible time of judgments, man will believe that they can defy God and believe that they can overcome and believe that they're going to make it through and they're going to trust in a false religion that introduces those to a false Christ. And so as we really get in verse by verse after this long introduction, when we get in and we look at these words and expositorily examine these words, you're going to see exactly the effect that was had and the result of the action of Babylon. Amen. <clears throat> I can't say anything else in way of introduction that can help you understand what we're getting ready to examine in the next two chapters. We're going to look at the three elements that we've talked about tonight over and over again. And we're going to see how Satan has used those to bring the world comfort, to deceive the world, and how that God judges each and every one of those. There is but one God, and we must trust and believe in His Son, Jesus Christ, if we are to have the hope of eternal life. And blessed are those who read the words of this prophecy. Blessed because we know that the way to avoid this is to trust Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Blessed to know that there is a hope beyond this world. Blessed to know that we can have the real thing, the real deal, and not be led astray by something so deceptive that it would take us to hell. Amen. Amen. But you need to understand and you need to know where your trust and where your confidence is tonight. And you need to understand how even today the world, uh, Satan, is using all three of these elements to discourage the world and influence the decision making of the world and maybe causing you to think in a way that you shouldn't think. Because we can overcome these things by trusting in Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the truth that we know, the truth that we have received, for the opportunity, Lord Jesus, to study your word and even delve into its depths, Lord Jesus, to find the promise and the hope that will help us in these days in which we live. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.